Now, uh, today we have our honor to have Professor Emil Bjornsson from Linköping University in Sweden to give us a talk about latest technology in wireless. Professor Bjornsson had all his education in Sweden, uh, particularly he received his P PhD degree at KDH as in Stockholm. Now, um, concerning how much I remember him, I remember when I was younger, I read several papers from Emil. It was quite nice. I mean, it was about multi-cell MIMO. Oh, by the time, th at that time, he was even younger. And uh, he, he is very famous for his research in massive MIMO. Perhaps most of you know it. And also multi-cell, selfie MIMO, uh, which again, I think it doesn't require a lot of introduction if you know Vowless. And he's some of the very outstanding researchers uh, when you talk about uh, Vowless technology. Uh, concerning awards, he got a 2019 IEEE Communication Society Fred Arasic Prize, 2019 Eurasip Early Career Award, 2018 IEEE McConey Prize Award, and several others. And yep, so without further ado, I will pass out. Oh, there's one more thing I should mention. Now, uh, apart from his uh, academic accomplishments, now he also did a lot of work on the education side. Now, you may know that he got a few textbooks. And also, um, if you um, would like to take a look at YouTube. Okay, hold on a second. Um, my computer is a little bit stuck, sorry. Um, Yeah, I mean, if you go to YouTube, you will find that he got a series of videos talking about various things about uh, MIMO technology and things like that, which I think is extremely helpful to the community. Okay, really, uh, without further ado, I would like to pass it to Emil. Thanks a lot for the introduction and for inviting me to give this talk here. I will just start uh, sharing my screen. So, uh, what I will talk about today is something that on the first look, it, there is no MIMO in the title here. So it might sound like uh, I'm not gonna talk about my favorite area that I've been trying to uh, get away with, but then come back again uh, after my PhD, which was MIMO communications. But in a way, this reconfigurable intelligent surface that I will talk about today is a new flavor of MIMO communications. And I will come back to that later. So what I will be talking about is a programmable wireless world with reconfigurable intelligent surfaces. Uh, so my talk will be structured into three main parts. First, I will give you an introduction about what are these things that I have in the title, reconfigurable intelligent surface, and what do I mean with a programmable wireless world? And then I will develop a system model for this because this is a signal processing uh, talk series, so that's why I think it's interesting to have at least some signal processing aspects to this, because a lot of people are concentrating on the electromagnetic aspects, but are not talking so much about the signal processing aspects. And uh, then I will, towards the end of the talk, mention some misconceptions that are floating around in this very fast-moving topic area, and some of the key open questions that I think is very important for people to work on in the near future. So if I'm starting with the introduction, I will, uh, yes. So let's just talk about the basics of the physics of wireless signal propagation. So wireless communication is really about sending electromagnetic waves that are carrying information. And as any type of electromagnetic wave, they are traveling at the speed of light and they are spreading out from the transmit antenna in all directions. So if you have the transmit antenna here, they are spreading out. You can view it as having a surface or a balloon that is blowing up and it becomes larger and larger and larger. And the signal energy is lying on the surface area of the sphere. And if you have a so-called isotropic antenna that is radiating it equally much in all directions, well, then the uh, signal energy is spread over this uh, surface area equally. And, uh, if you are then putting a receive antenna at distance D away and it have an area A, which is perfectly on the surface of a uh, sphere of uh, radius D, well, then it will capture a certain amount of the transmitter signal energy. 
So if it has area A, and you see that, okay, the surface area of a sphere with radius D is four pi D squared. Well, then it's the ratio between these two ones that is telling you how much of the transmitted power that you are getting as received power. So this is uh, one way of phrasing the famous freeze propagation formula from a, an old paper from 1946 by Freeze. And uh, this part here is what we can call the channel gain. Sometimes people are calling it the path loss or channel attenuation or something like that. Uh, and the important thing is that this is always smaller than one because you can never receive more power than it transmitted. We are not creating anything along the way. But what is very important to understand is that usually it's a very small number. So a typical antenna is sub wavelength sized. So say that we are working at the three gigahertz frequency, then the wavelength is 0 0.1 meter or uh, 10 centimeters. Then the area of the antenna might be these wavelength lambda divided by four times lambda divided by four. So it's a square sized thing. In that case, if you are putting your receive antenna one meter away, which is very short distance, then what you will receive is still only 0 0.005%. Uh, so it's minus 43 decibel if you compute this ratio here and uh, turn it into decibel scale. And if you move to 10 meters, well, then you are losing just another 20 decibels because of the square here. So you're receiving 0 0.00005% uh, minus 63 decibels. So it's essentially like saying that if you are sending out 2 million uh, pieces of energy, then only one of them will be received. And this is very important to understand when it comes to what I will be uh, talking about today, because it's only a tiny fraction of the transmit power that is received. And that means that small, seemingly unimportant changes in the wireless propagation might make a big difference. It might lead to you doubling or even more the received signal power. So actually, in reality, we seldom have the situation where you are seeing the transmitter. You might have this situation here. I'm standing in my virtual office. There is a base station on the neighboring building. I've removed the uh, uh, ceiling of this building, but you can see that there is no way that this signal that is sent out from this base station can reach me and my iPad uh, directly, but it will have to go through the wall. And in addition to those uh, things I've described in the previous slide that you might only have one out of one million parts that you receive, well, then you will lose maybe 20 decibel or more when you're actually penetrating the wall. And uh, what happens with the rest of the signal energy that you're sending out? Well, it's spreading out in all directions and some of them will make it into this room as well. For example, uh, some of it might go through this window and windows typically have smaller losses than a wall. So uh, the problem is that you can't see me through this window here. Uh, the signals will go in through the window and then it will reach the wall here. And then there is all kinds of wireless phenomena that's appearing. If you have a very smooth surface and you have a wave coming in, then uh, it will be bouncing off it and it, you will get some kind of specular reflection like things where you have a wave that goes in and the shape of the wave is not changed and it goes out again. We have the phenomena of scattering where the surface is uh, rough compared to the wavelength. And in that case, when the signal goes in, it doesn't go out in the same angle. It sort of gets split up and sent out in different directions. And then you have the phenomenal diffraction where the signal is hitting an edge or a corner and then it makes it around the corner. So it's sort of bending off. And this is the type of phenomena in wave or ray optics that you are usually seeing if you're studying a physics class on optics. But optics is usually about visible light. That is what people have in mind when they're writing textbooks. And then the wavelength in the optical range is typically 100,000 times shorter or smaller than what it is in the radio spectrum that we are considering, which means that if something should be considered rough or smooth, depends on roughness that is uh, at a different scale. So that means that in most cases, it is the type of scattering behaviors that you will see and potential refraction. We shouldn't expect the reflection to happen in this very nice way. Uh, but I will come back to this phenomena in a moment. Uh, 
But what is then the idea of this programmable world and what does it do with this wave propagation? Well, there is this concept of smart cities uh, that people are uh, more and more engaged in, where the idea is that you will try to connect as much of information in a society as possible. So say that you, uh, you have a lot of different sensors and assets and resources, uh, services in, in a city like Hong Kong here, and you would like to manage them as efficiently as possible. Then there's a lot of data that can be collected by different sensors. And if you can fuse them together, maybe you can make better decisions on how to use things. So you can put up a lot of devices here, Internet of Things devices. Uh, it could, of course, be mobile phones or base stations that you put on the rooftops here or that the users are using. But it could also be various type of uh, sensors, temperature sensors, or whatever type of sensor you can put in a uh, factory or other places. And what you can monitor in a city is things like the traffic, the transportation systems like trains, different types of public utilities and services, uh, things like the water supplies, for example, or the, uh, the power grid. Uh, there's a lot of work on how to optimize those things as efficiently as possible. And people have hoped that you can sort of prevent crime by having a more intelligent city that could report when things are, are happening out of the ordinary. And the whole smart city concept is based on that you are collecting this big data and then you should manage your assets, resources, and services more efficiently. And how do you do that? Well, you, somehow you need to process these uh, input signals, the data, and you could potentially use machine learning methods to sort of try to figure out how to do this more efficiently. But can we, in addition to these type of things, also somehow control the wireless propagation in this city? Can we use the smart city concept and expand it not only to provide uh, you with access to this data, but also sort of tweak the propagation environment so everyone can get good coverage everywhere? And, and what does that really mean? Well, if we look back at this example that I was describing, where I'm standing in my virtual office and you have this base station on the neighboring building, and we know that the signal is going to come in through this window here uh, because this base station is at a fixed location. But people can be in any place in this room here. What can you do? Well, we could put up a special surface inside of this window. This is what we call a reconfigurable intelligent surface. And we can uh, sort of control it. And I will come back in a moment how to do that so that every uh, piece of signal energy that is captured by the surface is going to be instantly uh, retransmitted or scattered or reflected or whatever you want to call it towards me as a user. So this is showing some kind of beam pattern. Uh, and the name reconfigurable intelligent surface contains three words. Uh, reconfigurable means that somehow the properties of this surface here, which is a very thin surface that you put on the wall, can be changed. Intelligent means that it's real time programmable or controllable. And surface, of course, means it's a two-dimensional array. And what it will contain is uh, small elements that we call scatterers. And I will go into de uh, more details on that here. So this is an idea of how a reconfigurable intelligent surface could work. You have a transmitter somewhere. You have the surface. You have a user. And then you are programming uh, the surface and control it so that when the signal is coming in here, and we know that this signal is meant for user one, then all the signal energy that is received at this surface is going to be immediately beam formed towards user one. And then in the next millisecond, well, now you have another user, user two, that's interested in the signal. So let's now change it. Let the programmable controller change the behavior of the surface so that now it's instead beam forming the signal towards user two. And how can you build something like that? Well, the basic component is that inside of this big surface, you have small elements. Each of them is a small patch. It could be something that would be existing in an antenna. It's just that it's not connected to a conventional uh, transmitter or receiver chain that allows you to generate signals or extracting the signals in the uplink. Instead, it's just something passive, but it's reconfigurable in the sense that it's somehow connected to a switch that could help you to change its properties. Could be a, a diode, a character diode, for example. And that one is then connected to this programmable controller. And it's not injecting signals, 
to this passive patch, but it is changing its properties, uh, either by having some discrete values that you can select, okay, it should behave in this or that way, or it could be that you are having a voltage that you are varying continuously, and that will then create some kind of continuous change in its behavior under certain uh, constraints of what you actually can do. Uh, and it will come more clear along the way what this really means. So first, what is the material that you will use to build a surface like this? Well, uh, I would say this reconfigurable intelligent surface, that is a communication concept. And then how you actually build it, it can be implemented in different ways. A lot of people are talking about something called meta surfaces or meta materials, which is some kind of strange materials that behaves in a way that is physically accurate, but you don't see this type of surface in reality. So it can uh, reflect signals in different ways, for example. There is also a concept of reflect arrays in the electromagnetic literature. People have been working on that for 50 years, and it could also be built on various kind of uh, conventional patch antennas. So you can find experimental works with all of these type of materials where you try to build something like this. And I think building the surface by itself, it, it's not a challenge for someone who is uh, working in this field. We know how to, to build it in principle. Uh, the challenge is rather this reconfigurability. And in particular, to do this in real time so you can switch between these users. And there are different means of implementing it. And I will just mention those here. One would be to try to tune the impedance of these different elements. Another way uh, that I find more easily to understand from a signal processing perspective is to tune some kind of uh, length of delay lines. So you can think about that the signal is coming into the element, then it has to sort of propagate uh, along a delay line and then back again and then it gets reflected. And uh, by tuning the length of it, you can tune a delay, for example. And there is also the conventional type of phase shifters that people are talking about in millimeter wave communications uh, that you could potentially use as well. And what I will be talking about today is not a particular implementation of this concept, but rather uh, if you can build something like this and you can reconfigure it uh, as you like, what could you achieve with something like this? And what's important to understand is that a single element here makes little difference because the only thing you can do with a single element is that you receive some piece of the uh, signal energy, maybe only one out of a million parts, and then it will send it out potentially with a different delay and with a, um, you can change things like such as a signal polarization, but not more than that. It's the joint effect on many of these elements that are needed in order to form beams in different directions. And uh, that will become clear when we are setting up the system model for this. So what is the idea then with the programmable wireless world? Well, the idea is that this RIS, the reconfigurable intelligent surface, as a whole should be able to control various things, such as that when a signal comes in, what will be the directivity of the scattered signal? It will form a beam in a particular direction. And you can potentially also decide on that, well, I don't want to scatter anything. I would like the energy to just come in there and then it's absorbed. Or potentially you will change the polarization. And here are some examples of things you could potentially do. So here is our library at Linship University. And uh, we know that if you're working in millimeter wave communication, for example, the things are not propagating very well through different materials. Uh, and you might have users at these different floors here. So what if you put up a base station at the top and then in order to make sure that the signal gets spread into the different floors, you could put up these type of surfaces at different places. And then the signal that comes from above hits the surface and then this beam formed into this uh, part of the floor or this part uh, is reflecting over here and then continues like that. So in this way, you can improve indoor coverage and uh, uh, you can make sure that the signals are getting a, a good reflection and you are getting line of sight like properties. You, the signal doesn't have to rely on penetrating different materials. Uh, here's a meeting place in uh, Luca where we'll have the sport conference next year. And suppose that something hidden is going on here. We are talking about something that people should not be able to eavesdrop. And if we are using wireless devices here in one way or the other, then the signals might be able to propagate through the walls here. 
that we can cover the walls with this type of reconfigurable intelligent surfaces and configure them so they are absorbing everything. Instead of obvious scattering, they're absorbing it. In that way, nothing will propagate through the walls while otherwise will just be the, the passive materials that is determining how, they, uh, how much that is penetrating the walls. And if you look at more outdoor scenarios, here I'm standing in a hotel room in Melbourne and you have a lot of different places, you have a lot of different buildings and big buildings can shadow other buildings and you don't want to put up base stations everywhere. Uh, so unless I can see a base station here, uh, I will, won't get a good signal. But what if you on some of the building facades are putting up this uh, type of reconfigurable intelligent surfaces. And then you are figuring out, okay, now this guy in this hotel room here would like to get a good signal. Well, then we are configuring these surfaces to reflect the signal towards me as a user. So these are some of the ideas about how you can program uh, the wireless propagation, both in the local areas and in the larger areas in order to get a better wireless world. And even if you just can contribute with a little bit of signal power, we know that a little bit of signal power can make all the difference because you are usually only getting one or a million or one billion part of the signal energy you're receiving. And you can argue that, well, why are you trying to talk about these alternative methods? Um, or why are you trying to create something new, reconfigurable intelligent surfaces? Why don't you do any of the classical approaches such as deploying more base stations? Well, we already have a very dense deployment of conventional base stations. And every time you put up a base station, you will have to have all the infrastructure for power uh, delivery and backhaul. Typically a base station might need a kilowatt uh, of power or more, and you will need a high speed backhaul. Uh, you maybe don't want to put that everywhere. So uh, that's why this reconfigurable surface, it could be useful. And they also creating more and more interference. So you will have to coordinate their decisions more and more if you have a lot of base stations uh, in order for it to work out well. Uh, and you can also talk about, well, we have the relaying technology, half duplex relays that you put up in different places. You send a signal from one place, it's received here. And then when you have received it, you repeat it to another place. And that is sort of the same concept here. You're sending a signal and then you have a reconfigurable intelligent surface that is reflecting it here. And the difference uh, is that these reconfigurable surfaces are semi-passive. You are reconfiguring them, but they are not adding any signal energy to the propagation. So in that way, they could potentially be much uh, less uh, energy hungry. And you also you can put it in a more transparent way into the system because uh, you don't need to let the base station uh, turn on and off its transmissions depending on when it's time for the relay to transmit or not. If you are putting up these type of surfaces, they are working in what we call full duplex operation. They are just there. They are passively reflecting and they are sort of adding additional paths to your propagation environment without having to have a dedicated time to doing that. And you can also say, well, why don't we just uh, skip this concept and we are using better materials that are not blocking our wireless signals uh, so that the millimeter wave signals are going through the walls or when we are moving up even further in the frequency domain, uh, we would like the signal to just propagate through the walls much better. Well, the main reason for putting up walls in your buildings is not to have good wireless coverage, but to have a good thermal insulation uh, so that in particular in Sweden, when it's cold in the winter, we will like to be making sure that we can keep the heat inside. And that also keeps the signals outside. So it's hard to, uh, to achieve thermal insulation and also get signals through. And even if we put up passive materials like a metal sheet on the building so that the signals are getting reflected in a good way, uh, it's not um, sure that the signal will happen to just hit in the direction where you happen to be. Usually, if you are studying wave propagation, you know there is Snell's law that says that if the signal goes in with one angle, it will go out with the same angle. Uh, and that is not at all guaranteed to hit you where you are as a user. So the main use case of these surfaces would be to focus signals at the user. So uh, it's sort of a way of expanding the size of your antenna and receiver. Because if you have a mobile phone with just a small antenna inside of it, uh, you cannot capture more energy than you have in, inside of that uh, uh, surface area. But 
if you are thinking more like a satellite receiver, where you have this uh, type of dish antenna that is capturing a lot of energy and then it's focusing at the receiver, you can view these surfaces as a way of synthesizing the same idea. So say that you have an incoming signal. I'm showing it here. It's a plane wave that comes from the left. And then it hits a curved metal surface here. And this surface is curved such uh, that uh, the signals are going to be focused at the receiver at a particular location. And that means that all of the energy that is uh, hitting the surface here will ideally appear at the receiver here. And this is just a, a passive surface. So the place where the receiver uh, will, or the signal will be focused, where you would like the receiver to be, happen to be the place where all of these paths here are equally long. And the way that I've described it here is like, okay, the signals is uh, consisting of rays. Here you have one ray, here you have another way, ray, a third, a fourth, and fifth one. And then it goes like this. But radio waves are generally not described by rays. Uh, it, it's never consisting of rays, but when you are uh, taking optics uh, classes uh, at the university, it's a good approximation in optical range to say that we can break down the, the wave into rays, and then you can compute how each of these rays uh, here are being reflected. But in general, the way to view how this works is that when one piece of the signal is hitting the surface, it will be scattered in all directions from the surface. This is something called the Huygens Fresnel principle. And uh, you can view it as at every point on the surface here, you will have a um, like a point source that is scattering the signals uniformly in all directions. And then uh, depending on the phase shifts or the time delays of the signals, uh, these waves that are propagating from these different places on the surface, at some places they will be received in phase. They will have exactly the same time delay, namely where the distance to this receiver is the same. And at those places you will get a strong signal and other places you won't. So, here you will get a beam form because uh, you have the same distance to all these uh, places on the surface. And this is what we are trying to synthesize with a reconfigurable intelligent surface. And it's not a curved surface, it's supposed to be a flat surface. But in the surface, we have these small elements. And when one piece of the signal is hitting this element, it's also going to be uh, scattering the signal in all directions. But what we can do is that we can process the signal. We can filter it inside of the surface here so that we can make sure that still at the same location here at the receiver, we will getting the strong focusing. And what you can view this is that you have a incoming signal here, uh, S of T, and you have N different elements. And for each of these signal pieces here, you will get a uh, signal S of T. It will have a propagation delay, which you can compute by taking the total length here. And then you have an additional delay within the surface. I call it delta n here. So in each of these elements here, you can add a delay. And that is a controllable thing here. And then what you receive here is a summation over the signals. And then you have a channel gain here that says how much you have lost along the way. But that's not the important thing here. The important thing is that you would like all of these pieces here in the sum to be adding in phase. So you will have the same delay here. So that is what you are doing in order to synthesize this type of shape here. You make sure that tau n plus uh, delta n is equal for all the n at a particular location where you would like the signal to be focused. And since uh, what you can control is this time delay here and a delay must be a positive amount of time, well then the sort of causal solution to something like this is to make sure that uh, they are equal and they are equal to the largest of these different delays. You take the uh, element here that is furthest uh, away and then the other one, uh, that one adds no delay at all or the minimum delay you can put there and then the other ones are delaying it, their things in such a way that you are synthesizing a surface that is focusing the signal at the receiver. Okay, so how large would these different elements in the surface be? Ideally, we would like to be able to uh, continuously change the delays. So this color here is sh uh, showing what are the delays. So if the signal comes in from a particular direction, you would like to go off in a different direction. You can compute what kind of delays you would like to have. 
and you would like to be able to continuously change them in the surface. But of course, you, in reality, it's very hard to change something continuously. So you, you would instead discretize it. And so you have different elements at uh, the particular size, and each one of them will be scattering the signal with a particular delay that we can control. And if you zoom in at one of these elements, and you say that the signal is coming in from uh, minus 30 degree here, then we know from what we call Snell's law that uh, if you have a passive surface, the signal will go out with the same angle from the uh, orthogonal uh, direction here. So we will be strongest in the plus 30 degree angle direction. And if we look at surface of different sizes, if it's half the wavelength and half the wavelength, you get this red curve here. And you can see that uh, this is a normalized gain, how much signal is radiated in a particular direction. And we can see that most of the signal energy is going out in that direction and much less in other directions. If you make it smaller, lambda by four times lambda by four, you get the blue curve here. Now you still have the strongest uh, direction in according to Snell's law, but the variations are smaller. And if you make it lambda times divided by eight times lambda divided by eight, you have a much more flat uh, uh, description here. And what we would like to be able to control is the direction. You don't want a particular element to have a preferred uh, directivity. Uh, determined by where the signal happened to come from. You would like to be able to tune this perfectly depending on where the user is. So you would like to have a small element size. So you get this black one here, and then you can tune the phase delays so that you can form beams in different directions. So each element should scatter the signal almost uniformly. So you would like to be down at like uh, lambda divided by eight or lambda divided by four. These type of cases is the sizes of the elements that people are considering. And I'm talking today about reconfigurable intelligent surfaces, but there's a lot of different names for the same idea. People have been talking about intelligent walls or software controlled metasurfaces or reconfigurable intelligent surfaces or reconfigurable AI metasurfaces or intelligent reflecting surfaces. And uh, in my overview paper from last year, we were mentioning all of these ones. And uh, maybe some people are reading slightly different things into these different terminologies but i think in a general sense they mean the same thing uh, so you can just pick one of them and uh, i think there is some kind of convergence uh, against uh, or towards that people are calling it reconfigurable intelligent services okay so since this is a signal processing topic let's uh, go in a bit more and talk about the signal processing aspects and develop a signal system description so you have a transmitter that sends a signal to this element. You have a receiver over here. And let's look at just the channel uh, to this uh, one of the elements. You have a channel here, you have a channel here. And the way of describing this with signals or systems would be that you're sending a continuous time signal. The channel is a filter with an uh, impulse response. The element here is a reconfigurable filter. So it has an impulse response, also depending on which element it is here. And then you have a control variable theta n that you can somehow control, decide on uh, how the filter should behave under certain circumstances. And then you have a channel to the receiver. It's also described by an impulse response, uh, h n of t, and you have g n of t. These two are given by nature, and this is what we can sort of reconfigure. And then we know from signals and systems that the received signal, y of t, is going to be a convolution between the different uh, impulse response of the filters here and the transmitted signal. So this is what we are going to be receiving. And let's focus for simplicity on a narrow band system where the signal that we are sending is just a complex exponential. E to the power of j, the imaginary number, two pi. We have fc, which is the carrier frequency uh, in the complex baseband. And then we have a t, which is time. And the filter, let's just call it, that's the impulse response g of t or a frequency response to Fourier transform g of f. Then the received signal y of t, is going to be a convolution between g of t and x of t. And if you write it up, it's going to be this integral here. Uh, from minus infinity to infinity, we have the input response here. Then you have x of t, you replace t by uh, t minus uh, tau. And uh, then you are uh, integrating here. And what you can observe is that we have one term here, e j two pi f c t. That is, doesn't depend on the, this uh, tau here. You put it in front. And then the rest of it is actually the definition of the frequency response, the Fourier transform of this. So we can write the output as the, uh, the frequency response for a particular uh, frequency, the one that we're using. And then we have just the original signal here. So this is uh, how 
uh, these type of things system work. So what, what happens is that the transmitter signal, when it only have one frequency, the amplitude has changed based on the frequency response amplitude. And then you have a phase shift or a time delay uh, as well, also determined by the filter. And what that means for us when we have a received signal, which is the convolution between two channels and the filter in the element, is that we will just get the received signal, which is the product of the uh, amplitude changes that you are getting from the two channels and from the element. And then we have the transmitted signal when you have this X of T. Uh, and you get a joint phase shift or delay that is determined by the argument of the two channels and of the element. So let's uh, make it simple and consider a case where we have a line of sight channel from the transmitter to the, el the uh, element here and from this element to the receiver. The distance is dn and here is delta n and the area of this element is a. And then remember the first uh, technical slide I had where I was saying that this freeze propagation law is saying that the path loss or channel gain from, uh, over a line of sight channel is the area of the receiver a divided by four pi, and then you take the distance, which is dn square here. And then since we are talking about things in the amplitude domain here, we take the square root. And then you get a propagation delay, which is determined by, here you have from the signal, and then you uh, can say that the signal needs to propagate dn distance, and it propagates a speed of light. So this is the delay. And in the same way, the line of sight channel that you have uh, from the element to the receiver have the same shape, you still have an area A here, we still have the delta N square here, and then you have delta N here which in the delays. And the reconfigurable filter, that is the one where we can control somehow. It has also an amplitude change and it has a delay here. And to make it simple, let's call this uh, phase shift on the first channel, uh, phi N, and here we have uh, var phi N, so it's the same, phi both cases. Uh, that means that when we are computing our received signal, it should be the, the product of these different uh, frequency responses and the signal that we're sending. In that case, you get the product of this uh, amplitude part. You have this here. So you have the area, you have four pi, you have the product of the two distances. Then you have the uh, amplitude change from the reconfigurable filter. And then you have the joint effect of this phase shift, this phase shift and this phase shift. And what we can chew is this amplitude that you get uh, in the reconfigurable filter. And it's something between zero and one because we can decide on uh, if you put zero, we are absorbing everything. If you put one, we are, are reflecting or scattering everything. And then we can change the phase here. Let's say we can change from zero to two pi. In some cases you can have a larger range. It doesn't really matter uh, from a, a signal system point of view but it, you, it determines the actual uh, delay that you create. And that was then the signals and system model for just one element. But if we are having a large surface here with a lot of elements, capital N elements, and you would like to focus the signal at this receiver here, then the received signal here will be that you take the transmitted signal, you multiply it with what I was computing on the previous slide, this uh, uh, joint effect of the channels and the surface for one element, you sum it up for all elements, and then you add noise, and that way you get the received signal. And the signal processing problem will then be to maximize the signal to noise ratio. And by doing so, you will be actually forming a beam towards this user, or focusing the signal at the user. And it is then the summation here that you would like to make as large as possible in absolute value square. So, if you look at this channel gain here, you take this term here and you uh, take the absolute value square of it, you will like it to make, be as large as possible. And how can you make something uh, large as possible? Well, one way of viewing it is that, okay, you're summing up a number of terms. And if you like the sum to be as large as possible, you will like all of them to be positive or at least have the same angle in the um, complex domain. Uh, and in that way you will add them up and then you also like to, them to be as large as possible. So that would mean to make sure that this phase term here is the same for all of the users or all of the elements and uh, that you select this mu n to be as large as possible. And you can also show this mathematically using the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality that you would like uh, 
to make all these faces the same. So you get something like this, and then you take mu n to be equal to one. So you, you can prove this yourself. And, and you achieve this when all of these different um, summations are the same, uh, are the faces. And as a final step, we can also say, okay, usually when the user is far away, the, it's important to remember that the faces are changing, but the path loss is almost the same from all of the elements. So if you say that these dn and delta n are approximately the same, well, then you will get something like this, where you can take away this uh, uh, subscript and you are just getting n square because you have a summation and uh, you have a square. So you get the square of number of elements and then you get this path loss term for each element. And to show you some basic performance benefits of using this type of surfaces, say that we have a transmitter, transmitted to receiver, and you have put up a uh, intelligent surface here. And you have minus 75 to be here, minus 75 to be here on these channels. And then between transmitter and receiver, we have two cases. One when we have a bad channel, and one when we have an equally good channel here. And we have some reference transmit power here. In case one, when you have a relatively bad channel between transmitter and receiver, the spectral efficiency in bits per second per hertz that you can achieve as you're changing the number of elements in the surface here is varying like this. If you don't have any surface like or at all, you get this baseline curve, it's a constant. While when you are having a surface, you get a red curve and you see that it's increasing rather rapidly with the number of elements. So then it pays off a lot to have an element, a surface, even if it's relatively small, you can double your spectral efficiency or more. In the case when you have a relatively good channel from the beginning, you already have a quite high spectral efficiency. You still gain from adding a, a reconfigurable surface, but you will need to have a much larger surface before you are seeing the good gains here. So I would say that these surfaces are particularly useful when the direct path between transmit and receiver is blocked somehow so that it's relatively weak and then you can add an additional path that is uh, uh, even if it's relatively weak, it's still good enough to get to you a good performance gain. So I will wrap up by briefly mentioning some of the misconceptions and open problems in this field. So uh, I have a paper called Reconfigurable Intelligent Surfaces, Free Myths and Two Critical Questions. And I won't dive into them in any detail, but just to read them up for you. The first myth that some people have been spreading in literature, because this is a very fast change in literature. People like to say that current technology cannot control the propagation environment at all. Uh, and now we have this reconfigurable surface that can do that. But the truth is that a reconfigurable surface is a relay that is getting a signal there and then scattering it. It's not a regular type of relay that usually is amplifying the signals before retransmission, but it still is a type of relay. And relays have been uh, existing in or in standards since 3G. So it's not a new feature per se, but it, it is a type of relay with very unique properties that might make it much more useful than previous technologies. So that's why it's still very interesting to look into. Another myth is that this intelligence reflecting surfaces uh, or reconfigurable intelligence surfaces have a better asymptotic uh, array gain or improvement. You saw that the SNR that I was developing scale with number of antennas or elements as n number of elements squared. And if you are just considering regular beam forming from an array with n elements of the same size, then you would only see an SNR that grows with n. And that has led some people to believe that, well, n square is, of course, better than n, right? Uh, yes, asymptotically, you know that this a curve that is uh, increasing faster would always cross another term. But the problem is that uh, this description here was based on that I said that the dn and delta n was the same for all of the elements. And that only ha holds when you are in the far field. So if you would be comparing here the SNR, depending on the surface area, with this reconfigurable intelligent surface and with some kind of other classical things like a half duplex relay. Uh, that relay is getting a much higher SNR. It doesn't grow as fast with the surface area of the array. Uh, so uh, you see the faster scaling here due to this n square. But when you would expect the uh, intelligent surface to cross it, well, then is when you are leaving the far field. In that case, you won't see this type of behaviors anymore. So a, 
it's not like you should trust the scaling behaviors and say that uh, one technology is better than, than the other. It's instead that you should compare a, say, one meter times one meter uh, passive reconfigurable surface with a more active single antenna uh, this, decode and forward or other half duplex relays. And in those cases, a larger surface uh, can be traded towards having a lower energy consumption. That is sort of the idea. And another misconception is that you should view these surfaces as being a plane mirror. Uh, and a plane mirror behaves like this. If you have a transmitter that sends a plane wave here and it bounces off an infinitely sized mirror, then you will see a plane wave go through here. And then as you can see, the receiver is only capturing a small part of it. And if you are looking yourself in the bathroom mirror, you only see yourself in, in part of the mirror. The rest of it is wasted. But that is not the case with the reconfigurable intelligent surface because even if you have a finite sized surface here, what you are doing is that you're synthesizing this type of curved surface so that you are focusing the signal at the receiver and the entire surface is useful. So we can greatly outperform a plane mirror. So we shouldn't think about this as some kind of special mirrors with uh, what you call anomalous, which means that you can change the reflection angle. It's something completely different that you could be much better than that. So what are then finally the open questions? Well, one thing is that we still lack a really convincing use case for these type of things. I've been describing uh, that, okay, we would like to create this pro uh, programmable world, uh, which is sort of a fluffy way of describing that we would like to make something better. But what we should remember that in the work for 5G communications, some methods that people were investing a lot of research time into took off. Massive MIMO, which I've been working on, is now used to increase the spectral efficiency in 5G. And the millimeter wave technology is used to be able to have more bandwidth. And the combination of these two things is what's very useful. But there's also other things that people are branding as, oh, we're going to have this 5G topic here. There is what is called NOMA, non-orthogonal multiple access. And there is something called spatial modulation. Both of them have been sold in the literature as being 5G topics. And none of them are in 5G right now. And it's also uh, not clear if they will be included or not. And that doesn't mean that they are bad technology per se, it just means that what we were, the way that we were trying to develop them and um, was not based on showing the right gains towards the right, right baselines. So what we should remember or think about is what are we configurable and tell them really good at? Uh, something uh, that can be improved by 10 times some kind of metric, spectral efficiency or something else, over competing technologies. It's not enough that you can say, if you have a system without the surface and you put in the surface, it's gonna be better. Yeah, but you can also put in something else and it will also be better. But what can it do that nothing else can be do? Uh, no other technology can do. And that is sort of where no man spatial modulation failed because there were alternative technologies like these ones that were much more convenient to use. And there's no good answer, yes. I have some thoughts. I think that these intelligent or reconfigurable surfaces uh, can operate, uh, enable operation when you have a very sparse channel, say above 100 gigahertz or already a millimeter wave bands. You have a huge amount of bandwidth, so you can achieve a huge data rate, but only if you receive a signal at all. And the signal gets easily blocked by your hand or a different element. Uh, and you would like the signal to be received to your mobile phone from all possible directions so that you're hopefully not are blocking it from all directions as user. And it will not be so uh, economically feasible to put up uh, active arrays everywhere. So from that reason, uh, you can have this kind of passive surfaces that improves propagation conditions. And as you're also moving up in frequency, uh, you can enable much larger arrays uh, using this type of passive approaches. Yeah, hold on. Uh, than uh, you would be able to do uh, when you have a active massive MIMO type of array. The second open question, which I will just briefly mention is that you need to sort of learn the channel somehow and the surface is passive. So how can you know what kind of phase uh, delays you are going to add at different places? Well, uh, there are some initial thoughts about how to do that. One is the code book approach where you have a transmitter that is sending a signal to the surface. And then the surface is, um, changing how it's reflecting the signals, switching through different configurations while this transmitter is sending the same known signal over and over again. 
And then the receiver is figuring out what configuration that's preferable, tells the control about that, and then uh, you operate like that. The problem is that you have very many different configurations. It scales with the number of elements. And if you have uh, thousands of elements, you, this might not be a good uh, type of feature. So some people are thinking about, can we use parametric models for this, estimating positions and angles, or can we use machine learning? There's a lot of thoughts about that. And there are also some thoughts about changing so that some of these elements are active. So to wrap up, is a programmable wireless world possible? It's easy to say that conventional technology can only control the transmitter and receiver. We have no control over the propagation environment. And now we have a new technology that can control the entire wireless propagation. The truth is that uh, we can control some minor parts of the wireless propagation. And that might be enough. We should also remember that an active MIME array can do anything that a reconfigurable internal surface can do. So it's rather about figuring out what are the cases where it's much more convenient to have a passive surface. And the hope and vision is that reconfigurable internal surface can make a real difference for the wild propagation, and it will be much more cost and energy efficient to use this technology compared to other ones. If you would like to contribute to this field, I think it's very important to first learn at least the basics of multiple antenna communication, because this is sort of having a multi-antenna link from transmitter to this surface and from the surface to the receiver. And I will take the opportunity to recommend my, my book where you can read about these things. Uh, you can download it from smimebook.com. It's for free. And here are some self-references that you can read. You can uh, look at the slides afterwards. And, and if you would like to know the, uh, some more about the channel modeling, something like that. And I think you should really try to look behind the hype. There's a lot of papers coming up every week on archiving this topic, but there is much fewer works that actually are concentrating on these two open questions that I was mentioning. And as we also said in the introduction, there are more YouTube videos of me also on this topic, and they are using completely different slides. So it's useful to look at them even if you have attended this talk. So that's it for my presentation part. Okay, so uh, thanks Emil, Emil for the very interesting talk. So- Sorry uh, to interrupt a little oh. bit. I think I see quite a number of questions. Yes. So uh, we probably, both all of us has to be slightly more concise in uh, addressing those questions. You can remove my question, by the way. Uh, oh, okay. I, I can always ask Emu later on in the future. So, yeah. Okay. So, uh, so actually I will try to go uh, one by, uh, like uh, in order. So uh, uh, so to answer your question, there, there are actually a lot of questions. So, okay. So uh, the first question came from Neil. So uh, he asked like, so, uh, like how does the channel estimation work for continuous surface? And actually there's a bunch of uh, other attendees who have similar questions like uh, how, do, how does uh, the channel estimation, let's say work with uh, uh, Waylay or YCN channels? And what, what if you want to do it like in the near field or like how, hmm. how would that be done? So yeah, no, so, uh, I think that's a, a very good question. That's also why I think this is an, uh, to a large extent an open problem. There, there are probably, you can find 20 papers or so on that topic. Uh, and I think that they are not uh, really uh, addressing the problem so that you have a practically useful solution. There are basic uh, approaches that works, but if you were like to really be able to real time control this, that mm -hmm. then you need a method of doing this that is very fast. And uh, yeah, I was mentioning here on the slide, this type of uh, parametric models, for example. And then the problems is that, yeah, if you only have one path, then you can, and you know the surface dimensions, then you can have a parametric model. But then you were mentioning if you have a near field or if you have scattering of different kinds, well, then parametric models become complicated. Maybe machine learning can be used to learn the local propagation environment somehow. Uh, but I, I think this is, to a large extent an open problem how to do this in an effi efficient enough manner so that you uh, you can actually use this once in, in a good way i see so so you're so you're suggesting that maybe we can use machine learnings and i mean some other more advanced tools are even in the more even in the complicated situations where you have to handle near field or weather channels as well Am I right to you, you, interpret it yeah. this way? Yeah, uh, I think so. so. So if you are satisfied, 
identified with a scenario where you are um, only uh, have a line of sight channel between the, mm -hmm. the user and the, the surface here, then depending on if you are in the near field or, or the far field, you, you can learn how how the signals will be propagating between those things with machine learning. And then you say, oh, but why don't you just write up a parametric model directly? Well, one thing that I neglected today is all kinds of mutual coupling and the other hardware effects that will come into this. So even if you, you can, and some people already have written up a proper model for this, uh, it neglects those type of effects. So I, I think that to really uh, do this type of things, you, you will need some kind of trainable parameters uh, as well. Then a good thing might be that the channel between the base station and the surface will be more or less static because the surface doesn't move, the base station doesn't move. There might be some other things in between mm -hmm. that are moving. But uh, uh, I think the complication is particularly this uh, link here. And if the user should be allowed to move at any phase, uh, pace, then you will, it will be, uh, you will have to have a fast protocol for doing this. I see. Thanks. Uh, so the so uh, the second the second question comes from uh, Kaiser. So he asks like uh, so the con so like so here we have the concept of like getting like a large intelligent service. So it always occurs in the literatures, and so is there like a threshold or so that uh, we can call an RIS a large service? Like for example, compared to MIMO, sometimes we call it a massive MIMO if you have more than sixty four antennas. Like what will be that threshold here for RIS? That's a, a good uh, question. So I, I think uh, uh, first, uh, if we should quantify, uh, if we can put a number on that, I think it should be the surface area in, uh, in meter by meter and not something that is based on number of elements because you can have, consider mm -hmm different number of elements. And mm -hmm. when you are eventually computing different kinds of formulas, you will always see that this is the surface area, the, how much energy you're covering mm -hmm. uh, or capturing that is uh, determining this. And uh, yeah, I'm not sure if it's a good, good way uh, or um, if there is a, a way to, to put a particular number on it. But what I've seen in, in some of my works uh, is that you need a critical number of elements in order for this to to really work at all because if it's too small mm -hmm. you, the additional energy you get from one just one small scatter is very small so it's true yeah so i i think you you might need a thousand elements uh before you really mm -hmm. see a, a good uh i see game there. and the first time i saw this type of numbers i was thinking oh this is crazy thousand elements and then i realized yeah, oh, look right. Uh, you, you can squeeze in these many elements in a one meter ten one meter area, and, and then it's. Okay. Uh, I then, think it makes a lot more important. sense. <laughs> yeah, then it makes much, much more sense. Uh, right. So uh, I'm trying now when I'm writing papers uh, to also, even if I think it's instructive to have the number of elements on an axis when you're changing something, I also try to to mention uh, how large is the surface at this particular point, for example. Got it. So actually, he also wonder like oh. Uh, so in the case when you have a large surface, so will there be some sort of uh, effect like channel hardenings, like we see, like what we see in massive MIMO? Uh, so uh, channel hardening is something that appears when you have a lot a lot of scattering, uh, mm -hmm. and then the idea is that when you have a large surface, you are getting more and more independent scattering effects. So so yes, if you uh, have a large surface and you experience independent scattering of different parts of it, well then, yes, you, you will see this type of, of channel hardening type effects. But then at the same time, I, I think that main use cases of this would be in more type of line of sight scenarios, where line of sight always contains, of course, a line of sight path and some scattered paths. But the line of sight path is the strongest one. And I wouldn't be so much concerned about the um, this the channel hardening type of phenomena but there are interesting uh, things that happens when you have a large surface when you are approaching the near field uh, and that those things I, I think is interesting to to look at instead and i have a paper called power scaling laws and near field behaviors of massive mime and intelligent reflecting surfaces that is talking about those type of things and uh, as a rule of thumb that those things kick in when uh, if you say that you have a 
the width of the surface is equivalent to the length uh, or distance from it. That is when this real uh, near field effects kicks in. So it's not like the Fraunhofer distance or things like that. Uh, I see. I I'm see. sorry to slightly interrupt. So uh, if there's no channel hardening, uh, can we say that it can give you a stronger aperture when you have so many elements with your refracting surface? Or also the speed, you, you can make your beam narrower and narrower. Yeah, so, on, so on the location you want. Yes, so uh, when it comes to the, the beam width of the signal that is uh, reflected from it, it's computed in exactly the same way as if you have had an active MIMO ray. So the, the wider and, uh, and taller it is, the uh, narrower the beam width is going to be. And then as it goes to infinity, you get this type of effect where plane within gives you a plane width out. But, uh, uh, that's typically is not happening in radio spectrum very quickly because uh, a, if you view yourself, if you see that, okay, I can use uh, something like this size and look myself in the mirror and it works out in visible light. And then you should remember that it needs to be a hundred thousand times larger in all directions uh, before it works as a equivalent mirror in uh, radio spectrum because the wavelength is larger. Um, so uh, that's why I'm trying to iterate that ref True specular reflection seldom appears in this field. It, it's more scattered type of things when you're forming beams. And, uh, and then you're right that the, the beam width is determined. Uh, it's inversely proportional to the, the width. Uh, so the third question. So, uh, so is there like any performance loss if the frequency is increased at all? Like what's the relationship with the operating frequency here? So you would... So on the one hand, you can view this as something that is frequent, uh, frequency independent. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you have this uh, type of behavior that I was describing uh, here, uh, that you want the, uh, the size of the elements to be such that it, uh, each element sc oh. scatters things. But, but, but I think what is a real limitation is that uh, uh, and I think where it's important to, to look beyond what is done in literature today is that most people are considering this type of uh, uh, narrowband channel models that I was describing. And the element is creating uh, just one phase shift that is determined by actual time delay. So if you are changing the frequency a lot, uh, it's the, what is fixed is the, the uh, time delay. And then what a time delay means in terms of how much a wave is uh, delayed in phase depends on what frequency you are. So if you're using a large amount of bandwidth, uh, you will have to sort of say in the middle of this band, I will focus the signal. And then uh, at other parts of the band, the beam would sort of move in other directions. That is what is called beam squint effect. And uh, that's something that will appear. And in reality, it might also be that a, a an element like this won't create exactly the same delay for every frequency. It will have some kind of variations as well. So there are some hardware effects there. But uh, uh, one of the known issues with approximating a uh, curved metal surface with a flat surface that has been known uh, in the reflector ray literature for 50 years is that it only works for a relatively narrow band that you can do exactly like this. I see, I see, yeah. So there is a limitation here indeed. Uh, yeah. Right. And there so, are some works um, that, 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 uh, where people are working with OFDM, mm -hmm. for example, which I think is the right approach to do this. Uh, so, uh, so a question from Meme. So what will be the difference between the RIS phase shifter and the analog beam forming for traditional mini wave, millimeter wave networks? And actually compared to uh, analog beam farmings in those, what will be the new challenges in optimizing this phase shifter for RIS? Yeah, so in a way we can view the system as uh, that you, you have an array here with uh, uh, you, you capture energy here and then in the second uh, phase that happens immediately when the signals are, are getting transmitted towards the receiver here, it behaves exactly as an analog uh, beam formula would do with this phase shift that you can, can change. So it's sort of like a phased array uh, and, and then the, there we have this effects that you, you select the phase, but it's actually a time delay and therefore you get the beam squinting and things like that. So, so the additional challenges is that 
how do you learn the channels and the, <laughs> uh, and that you get this kind of combination between uh, the channel from the, the source that is transmitting the signal to the surface and then from the surface to the user here. And, and that one will determine how much signal that is received here and what are the delays of those signals. And, and that makes it the problem much more interesting. Even if you know yeah. uh, MIMO, for, uh, it only will establish the uh, channel from transmitted to the surface or from the surface to the receiver, but not the combined thing. Yeah, so uh, another question from Anton. So, uh, like, uh, is like, how do you estimate the power consumptions when you want to use the LIS surface? So the phase shifter may also cause power, right? Yeah, and I think that is an excellent point. And uh, one of the things that we are also pointing out in this uh, paper with three myths is that uh, some there is this hope that reconfigurable intelligent surfaces will be energy efficient and cost efficient. That is something that is repeated mm -hmm. in the literature, but it's still just a hypothesis because oh. I think that uh, what will consume the most energy is the phase shifters and uh, particularly also these channel estimation and control loop. Uh, so mm -hmm. maybe people know what uh, a phase shifter costs if you use a phase shifter, but it's all of the other way that you can control the meta surfaces uh, with uh, barrier to diode, something like that. Uh, so someone needs to figure out a real mechanism for learning the channels. Uh, mm -hmm. And even if you tell the base station, or, or if the, you are able to learn the channel at the base station, you need to tell the surface how to reconfigure itself, use some con control loop, and all those things will consume power. And if you need to do it a lot, very quickly, and you need to send pilots very often, that mm -hmm. will consume a lot of energy. Yes. And before mm -hmm. you have figured out that piece, we cannot say anything for sure about what the energy consumption is going to be and whether it scales with the size of, of the surface or if you can get rid of that type of scaling. Uh, so hopefully it, you can make it work in a way that is not scaling with number of elements very well, very much, and then you can use a lot large surface, but we still don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think this also relates to the previous question. Uh, so a question from Han. So uh, mm -hmm. how do we optimize, how do we place those LIS? And what kinds of aspects or factors should I consider while choosing the locations of my LIS? I think uh, that yes. <laughs> this, this, picture, is, yeah. uh, this picture is sort of saying what I believe is a good case. You, you should try to find the cases where the surface will uh, see uh, mm -hmm. the R transmitter, and uh, then you will get good coverage in the area that is also seeing within the room here, for example. So in those type of, of scenarios uh, where it has line of sight to transmitter and to receiver, but the transmitter receiver doesn't see each other, those are the real good use cases. And, and then we need to, to, to think about that. Okay, first we put out the base stations, then we figure out where the users are, and maybe we knew that partially when we put out the base stations. And then you figure out what are the, uh, the places where we have bad service, and then we add uh, reconfigurable services there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so a question from Qin Qin. So, like, uh, <clears throat> so in a physical model for the line of sight channels, so does the second hope model build on the free space model, or does it actually require your element to be isotropic? Um, so uh, you can use any channel model uh, as you like here. What, what mm -hmm. I, uh, when I was developing the, the model here in my slides, uh, I used the, the uh, free space propagation model for uh, each of the, uh, the parts here. So this is a free space model and this is a free space model. And uh, the, the area here uh, is the area of the element. So, so I'm sort of using reciprocity argument to say why it looks like that. Uh, and then I've assumed that this transmitter here and the receiver here have isotropic antennas while the area here is something else. Uh, but you so can it's not really a requirement. Not. It's not a requirement, it's just for, for this particular example. You can use any exactly. antennas. And isotropic antenna doesn't exist, so. Uh, <laughs> that's good, yeah, that's good. So a question from uh, Joachim. So uh, I, even though I know he could unmute himself, but uh, I'm going to ask it for him. So. So here, what is the status when it comes to demonstrators? So I have any groups, uh, like any research groups started like building the services yet. 
to provide a proof of concept, or is this still theoretical, largely? No, no. So uh, building the surfaces is something that is uh, rather well known how to do. And, and the, the whole idea about reflect arrays, uh, which from the beginning were, were fixed arrays, and then they, they get some kind of adaptivity as well. Uh, people have been working on, on those concepts for 50 years. So uh, uh, okay. it, it was sort of a contender towards face arrays, for example, for a long time. And uh, I was browsing through a maybe 10 year old book uh, with chapter after chapter of different concepts uh, in electromagnetics and how to build those type of arrays. So there's a lot of work for that. And I think there, there might be five to 10 different groups in the world that are uh, printing these type of arrays uh, in different ways or, or building them and st have started to make some basic measurements on this. And uh, I am citing some of those ones in, in my papers as well. And you can find mm -hmm. them online. I think uh, the difficult part is still the reconfigurability. And if yeah. you want them to be real time reconfigurable from one millisecond to the next or something like that, then it will be yeah. challenging to add up on top of that. And that is why I'm also talking about programmable because the surfaces are there, the communication ideas are there, but the programmability and algorithms in between, the signal processing, that is what is missing and what's really required to make these things work together. All right. So the second last question from Leng Lan. So, uh, so I think he, so he, his, so he asked, so uh, I think that most of the problems that IOS can solve, so for example, like the blockage, SNR improvements, it can be solved already by some sort of a distributed MIMO. And the only, and the benefit here seems that uh, it is only about like lowering the power consumptions and lowering, lowering, lowering the cost. So uh, what would be your comment about it? So I think we, what one should think about is that we have had relays in the uh, wireless standards and 3G. And even if it's not something that you see every day, well, different types of relays are used in tunnels and, uh, and things like that today. And uh, it would sort of be a way of extending that type of work because an operator don't want to put up expensive hardware that requires a, a backhaul infrastructure and things like that everywhere. Uh, so, so an active array is not something that you would like to put everywhere just because of both the expenditure cost and the cost of operating it. But uh, maybe w one market model would be that uh, you convince people to put this up in their homes or that you, uh, you are as a um, operator of a smart building, you are putting these things up uh, in order to enhance the, the services that you as a building owner can, can deliver to people. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I think it is a good point that we are still looking for that good use case. And if people should invest mm -hmm. billions of dollars or uh, in order in to develop this from a concept to a real product, we need to, to make this kind of good uh, case. And uh, I think we, we still have five years or so to figure this out uh, as yeah. an academic researcher uh, before the industry will have to decide, is this worth it or not? Yeah, I guess we can also get some insights from those groups that are actually building these things, right? Yeah, because and there are startups that are talking about oh. uh, things like this. There is, a, I think it's a, maybe a French company, Greener Wave. Mm -hmm. There is the uh, company that is called Pivotal Comware. They are, have something that they call uh, the holographic MIMO, which is sort of a, a way of merging this type of ideas with mm -hmm. a transmitter. So, so you say the transmitter and the, the surface is inside of it. So it's sort of like sending the signal directly into the surface and then you let the surface beam form it. So it's sort of uh, like creating a hybrid beam forming in a different ways. And, and if you can make that work, well then maybe you can extend the different distances yeah. as well. So I'm sorry that I actually tricked a little bit. That's, that wasn't the second last question. That was the third one. <laughs> that was the third <laughs> last. <laughs> so the second last one here comes from uh, Pan. So, uh, so he asked like if an active element now is being added to the RIS. So for example, it's connected to the RF chain to facilitate channel estimation. Can this particular active element still reflect the signals with control the amplitude or phase? Uh, yeah, I, I, I think so. So, uh, so I mean, just as an antenna, uh, I should say I'm not a hardware expert, but I would say that uh, you, you know that an antenna in, in 
uh, in the base station or mobile phone, it, it's switching between being connected to the transmitter chain and the receiver chain uh, in TAD mode, for example. And in the same way, you could have it uh, connected to receiver uh, chain during the uh, uh, the reception of pilots where you would like to estimate channels and then you are switching it to uh, terminating it with the load so that it, it uh, becomes a passive thing instead and uh, I think that is definitely doable but otherwise you could just let it transmit actively uh, if you would like to afford a transmitter mm -hmm. uh, chain as well. Yeah so a question from Chandra so Chandra Murphy, I think. So uh, how will the LIS work when you have multiple receivers? Yes, uh, so th that becomes an interesting question. So it becomes a bit like thinking about hybrid beamforming as well, where you can can use a hybrid beamforming to beamform signals towards different users. So, so one way of viewing it would be that you are taking your surface, you cut it in half, and then you let one part uh, beam form towards one user and another half beam form to another user. And uh, then you need to have a multi antenna transmitter that is sending this type of things one to one half and one to the other half, for example. But then we also know that ideally, in my view, you would like to use the entire arrays for everything. Uh, Mm -hmm. So, and that will just make the the way of selecting the right phase shift that is do, sending beams in two different directions at the same time. Uh, that becomes a more mathematically complicated problem, but it it is something that you can do. And by doing so, if you use the entire surface, you get a larger aperture, and then you get more narrow beams in different directions. So, so you can do this, and there are papers that where people are working on that as well. I just mm -hmm. didn't. Uh, show it here because the math usually leads to convex or non-convex problem that you need to solve in interactive manners. Uh, so it's it's not so, so nice to present in this perspective. <laughs> All right. So uh, actually in the queue, we just got uh, two more questions here. So do you like to answer them online or should we? Sure, we sure. I, I, okay. I, I can continue. Sure. So, uh, and now, so second last question, maybe the second last question <laughs> currently from Dud uh, Dudorov. So can we simplify the systems so that we don't need to scan the tilt angle like in a vertical plane? Is, can you repeat the question? Oh, so, uh, so he asked like whether we can simplify the system. So if we know that uh, we don't need to scan the tilt angle like uh, on the vertical plane. So yeah, so I, I think any type of uh, prior information that you can have about the uh, the location uh, is something that you should put into your algorithms. So, uh, so I if you you know that uh, uh, the user is going to be in the room and it's going to hold it uh, at oh, a certain height yeah, yeah. or some something like that, you, you, you know something uh, like that. Or you can try to design the surface so it, it, it doesn't have much height but much width. So, so then you only have beamforming capability in the horizontal plane, and that will also maybe make it simpler for for you to to build it. Uh, so what kind of prior information to have you put is something you should put in there. And that's also why it easily becomes more complicated than, than what we can do with just analytical models and why machine learning can be useful to, to really learn how to use it properly. All right. So I guess let's close this Q&A session by the following of futuristic question. So Terry, uh, so a question from Ter Terry. So will the future communication systems in 6G be dominated by LIS and massive MIMO? Is it, is it what you foresee in the future? Yeah, can you predict the future? The question is. <laughs> yeah, I, I do have a, a, a YouTube video where I'm trying to say something about 6G uh, as well as was one of those in, in the slides. Uh, I would say that, no, I don't think that IRS technology will be a, a the dominant thing. I even don't think that uh, moving up in frequency to uh, sub terahertz or terahertz bands will be the main thing. Uh, just as uh, there was all the fuss about millimeter wave is the thing in 5G, and then you see, oh, here's all the operators that they are uh, deploying 5G in 3 gigahertz bands. And then they maybe in five years' time, they're going to add other frequency ranges as well. And in the same way, it will be an add-on to go up in frequency. And I think that it might be that IR, 
RIS technology is needed to get a good use of uh, above 100 gigahertz bands so that you would sort of either need to put up many transmitters from all directions or put up one transmitter and multiple surfaces in order to, to provide you with good coverage as you move up in frequency. Uh, so uh, if we, uh, we're going to see a widespread use of these surfaces, it will probably be in the higher uh, ranges. And massive MIMO technology, different kinds, will, uh, the active ones will be dominating at the lower frequencies. And with time, we will see that it becomes easier and easier to, to build this one at higher frequencies. But right now, people have been saying that hybrid beam forming is the only way to build millimeter wave systems. But then you will see in five years' time that you have fully digital systems uh, uh, at 28 gigahertz and at 36 gigahertz, and then it will be increasing like that. But probably eventually you hit the, uh, a point where hybrid and then our RS technology will be needed to, uh, to make, get a good solution. All right. So uh, thanks, Emil, for the very uh, patient uh, answering for these questions. So I would say uh, that's the end for the Q&A sessions. And we should yeah, and Yeah. But before we but, say thanks to, okay. to Emil, I'll just have a quick yeah. advertisement. Now, since I will assume most of you guys are into communications. So next week, we got uh, Professor Wei Yu from, from University of Toronto talking about machine learning for communications. So again, we'll very, I will appreciate very much if you will join. Thank you very much. Yeah. And next, friends, uh, I'm Professor Bianson again. Right. Thank you. Thank for you. Attending. And for asking us a lot of good questions.